uh, I want to welcome you to the September meeting of the Ward 1 NPA. And um, we're just getting started. We've had a little bit of problem with the Zoom, but I think that's going to get straightened out. We've got a handful of people who are joining us now. If uh, anybody's watching this in a few days and they couldn't get in, we apologize. We had a wrong Zoom address, Zoom, wrong Zoom coordinates. Um, that will not happen next month. We'll be right spot on and it'll be fine. Um, thank you everybody for coming. We're in our new location, which is the Friends Meeting Space, which is a pretty exciting place to be. It's um, a little bit more welcoming, as somebody just said, than the, than the hospital. Um, and why don't we start with introductions, and then I actually have a fairly lengthy page of announcements that I want to go through before we get to speak out, and then we'll do speak out. So let's start with the room, and um, if people could just introduce themselves, just start here and go around, if we can do that. Just take a microphone and say who you are, if you want. Hi. Um, I am Jake Schumann. I live on Hildred Drive. I've um, been here for a year. I don't know if there's any other information you'd like me to provide, <laughs> so I'll just pass it along, I guess. Uh, Infinite Cult Leisure. I live on Rose Street. Cheryl Erickson, and I live upstairs, part of the Quaker community. Thanks for coming. Karen Long, I live on Henry Street. Sharon Busher, I live on East Avenue. I'm Angie Chapasopal, I live on North Prospect Street. Kathy Ogwell, also on North Prospect. Uh, Carter Newbieser, I'm over on Colchester Ave. Okay. I'm Brian Chena from Isham Street. Hi, I'm Carol Livingston. I'm on the steering committee. Um, I live on Colorado Court. I'm Jonathan Chapel Sokol. Oh, I'm sorry. Christopher. I'm Christopher McCandless from also from the Burlington Friends Meeting, Lake Cheryl, and I live across the street on North Prospect. Thank you, Christopher. I'm Jonathan Chapel Sokol, and I'm on the steering committee as well, and I live on North Prospect Street as well. Um, folks who are on Zoom, if you can. How do we do this? Let's start with Jim. I'm just going to go around. And could, could you just try again? I think we're muted here. We're still muted. We're, we're working on the audio. We're, we're in a new place and it's a new year and so there's a little bit of confusion. We'll get over, we'll get over. Uh, Martin, we can hear Martin. We can hear Jim. Okay, I think we might be there. Uh, let's try again. Jim? Yeah, yes. I'm Jim Drummond, I live in North Prospect here. Thank you. Uh, Martine? Hi, I am Martine LaRocky, I live in the New North End, and I'm here to uh, just give a quick intro in the speak out part of the meeting. Thank you. Sarah? Hi, um, um, I live off of East Avenue, and you, I got your meeting late, I'm not sure if you already know about the uh, meeting ID being incorrect on the front porch forum posting. Uh, probably you do. I, anyway, I was happy to get it from the city. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. We, we, uh, we just discovered it, and um, we're working our way through people who are trying to log in. I'm going to actually just check my mail to make sure there's nobody else in there. Uh, there are. Oh, no. That's good. <laughs> Okay, so why don't, why don't we get started? I want to go through some announcements and then we'll do speak out. Um, as I say, there's a few, so I apologize for taking up a ton of time in the meeting. Welcome to the new meeting venue, and please let us know how this works. And the Zoom will be 
much more straightforward next time. We'll make sure we have everything straight. Um, our thanks go to Christopher McCandless and the friends for the space. Domino's Pizza for the, for the sustenance. And please, at any time, go out and help yourself to the pizza which is out there. Uh, and Ojavi Zedek for the parking spaces. They've, uh, they're graciously letting us use the parking uh, just north of the building uh, on the other side of the street. First, piece, first item is that earlier this summer, the Ward 8 Steering Committee announced their decision to stop meeting with Ward 1 and to manage their own meetings. If you have any questions about this decision, feel free to contact the Ward 8 Steering Committee. As you may have already heard, Jack Hansen has resigned from the City Council effective today. So he is not here tonight. A city councilor has a lot to balance, constituent issues, city issues, global issues. And I want to thank Jack for his efforts in fi to, tr to find that balance. Um, and a very important part of this is that a special election will be held in the East District later this fall. And this is the most important thing. We need a city councilor. They could be you. People who come to NPA meetings and are interested in their community are just the kind of people who might want to be city councilors and might make great city councilors. So if you care enough about the city to participate in the NPA, you may just have what it takes to represent the district. Please think about it, even if you're on, on screen and not in the room. As we are now just three folks working on delivering NPA meetings, uh, this is the steering committee, um, we want to stress how much we'd appreciate more folks joining the committee. Do you need this? It's an opportunity for you to make this meeting what you want it to be. And if you don't want to commit to the steering committee, but you want to help with something, one of the things we definitely need help with is we need some youngster who understands social media and could help us better communicate to the community what we're doing and why we're doing it and when we're doing it. Um, so please consider joining the steering committee um, or just helping out, volunteering to help out. Thank you all for participating in the summer community activities we, we had, Ward One Night at the Lake Monsters and the Barbecue at Schmanska Park. We look forward to organizing more non-meeting community activities in the future. And it's really, again, it's up to the community what, what works and what we want to keep doing. This is an announcement from the Ad Hoc Reappraisal Committee. Um, the Ad Hoc Reappraisal Committee is holding a public forum on Thursday, <coughs> September 22nd at 6 p.m. in the Sharon Busher Room at City Hall and over Zoom if you don't want to attend in person. If you want to share your thoughts or opinions on last year's reappraisal process, and certainly over the past year many people have, but this is, a, this is the formal place where the committee is going to meet to uh, try to make some really solid recommendations on what to do going forward. Please come to the meeting or, um, or Zoom in. And there is a committee web page, which you can find on the assessor's web page. So if you go to Search directories, go to Assessor, go to the blue bar on the left side at the very bottom is the Ad Hoc Reappraisal Committee's um, web page. And you go there and meet, all the meetings are worn there. And you can see when they are and where they are and what the Zoom coordinates for it is, are. Uh, if you want to just provide written comments, and, and this is important because a lot of people don't want to come to meetings, but they might want to let people know how they feel about things. Um, you can, you can send your written comments to Joe Dempsey, who's the staff, the, the, the city staff representative on the committee. And that's J Dempsey, J-D-E-M-P-S-E-Y, at burlingtonvt.gov. Earlier this year, Ward 1 purchased a, a subscription to, to SurveyMonkey, a one-year subscription to see whether this is something that we want to do more regularly. But it's a way in which we can, we can poll folks uh, who may not come to meetings to express their opinions. If you have a topic you think should be surveyed, please let us know, and, or you can help us write the survey too. Uh, one example could be redistricting choices, because it's a very, there's a very small number of choices. It would be great to get a broader, a broader cross-section as to who feels what about what. Um, then some updates uh, from DPW. And, um, and I, uh, in the first, in the first is on Prospect Hill, and Prospect Hill sidewalks are about to get redone. Uh, and so I think things are going to close like as of tomorrow. It's going to get a little hard on Prospect Hill. Uh, and then Rob Goulding from the, from DPW has a report on North Prospect Street. And the short-term update on North Prospect Street is that tomorrow morning the contractor will be paving the trench at North Street and North Prospect, the intersection right over there. 
but the, but the road's going to be closed. Basically, everything's going to be closed at that intersection for, uh, for the day. It should be open by rush hour in the evening. Um, the long-term update that uh, he writes, our contractor has finished relining the water main. As part of the normal process for water main relining, we then conducted pressure tests to ensure structural integrity of the new liner. On one section of the liner, the pressure test did not pass due to leakage. All other sections of the liner have passed the pressure test. We will be sending a camera through. There's going to be a little colonoscopy on North Prospect. Send a camera, send a camera through, to, through the liner to help finalize the plan for this section, which will determine the repair method, either relining or replacing the whole section of the pipe. Uh, that will determine the scope and duration for the remainder of the project and ultimately finally, final paving the road. We expect the remaining water work to be done this year. All access pits will be paved to grade before the season is up. At this time, due to the, this delay, we now anticipate full width paving to happen in the spring. So if you have questions about that, you can address them to water resources or to uh, the DPW communications from them. Uh, and, and we'll work to make sure that there are ongoing front porch forum reports on this, just to keep you up to date on what's going on. And with that, I think we should move to speak out. Um, before you do that, Jonathan, can you just ask someone online to try and speak, see if we can get them here? Okay. Um, Fletcher, could you introduce yourself? And you're on mute. <laughs> Hi, Fletcher. Yeah. Happy to make it. Uh, <coughs> I have a date down now and uh, hope to make this a habit. Great. Great. Thank you. Can you try with just some notes? Um, Jim, could you just speak a little bit more just to test our audio here? I, I think so, but. I apologize, everyone. Um, the reason I ask is 
right during the coronavirus pandemic. So in these under these conditions, we're all seeing um, the impact on the streets and in, in our homes and our schools. Um, so I think it is important to have some people in the legislature with that direct experience. Um, but I'm, what I'm working on over the summer is, as a healthcare worker, I'm trying to come up with ideas about things we can do where we realign services or do our work differently so that with the same amount of money we get more from it. And I'm, and I'm trying to figure some things out along the way to like maybe bring back to the legislature next year and also um, talking with members of the administration and with the governor's administration along the way. Um, and I appreciate that uh, that he is working with me on a variety of things right now, at least in terms of this, even if we have our differences, we have the same goal of wanting to prevent violence and wanting to enhance public safety. Uh, the governor just released a, a plan in which he talked about um, strategically using police resources statewide and data to target violent crimes and to um, clear up the clog in the courts by um, having people prosecuted. And we are letting people, as a society, we're enabling people to hurt themselves and others at this point. It's, 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 it's really um, sad to, to witness on the ground level. But if we just round people up and throw them in overcrowded jails where we don't have enough corrections workers, it's going to be bad for the workers, the people, and the community. So I'm hoping that we can work together to um, use this moment in history to implement a pilot project in Vermont um, to try out the Norway model. And I'm happy to come back and talk about that in detail. But in Norway, um, the idea is that prisoners are your neighbors. And you treat them as neighbors. And um, it, that there's community campuses that people move into as they transition out of prison, and then a system of housing and support. And their recidivism rate went from 70% to 20% with this model. And if Vermont did this, we would become the fifth state in the US to try it. California passed a bill last week to start exploring this. And the world always looks at California and Vermont. So all eyes are going to be on us now. So now is the time. And I'm hoping to work with the governor and other members of the legislature to um, look at how to make corrections actually be a rehabilitation system for people so that we, when we take people's freedom for causing harm, we don't cause more harm because violence begets violence. And when the state uses force to try to get people to comply, what I've learned, whether it be as a healthcare worker, as, a, as an activist, um, unhoused people at Sears Lane, as a legislator, et cetera, that the prison system ha makes things worse for people. So this is a chance for us to, to to actually help people when we hold them accountable for the harm that they cause by not causing more harm. Um, there's a lot more I want to say, but I don't want to take up too much time. Um, I think we also need to look at the training of police when we deploy them and the training of healthcare workers and create consistent training across all the pieces of public safety and improve the coordination because I'll end with this, like I said, 40 to 60% of healthcare workers are, uh, of, of, of uh, jobs are open. And when you look at exit surveys with my union at the Howard Center, AFSCME 1674, uh, people say the reason they're leaving is they don't feel valued. And when I talked with Lacey, uh, Lacey Smith, the police social worker, she said that on the police exit interviews, what, what, is the, what is the main reason they're leaving? They don't feel valued. So instead of us all um, being pit against each other, we need to bring people together in public safety and create a culture where we're all getting supported properly and we're, um, so that we're not harmed in the process of doing our, our jobs and so that we're not causing any more harm to people and that we're truly promoting the public good. So I'll end on that note. Happy to come back. There's other people. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, just there. Oh, Sure. Come over here. Come over here. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Catherine Hill. I'm not running for anything. But I'm here to support my friend Jake Shimmer, who is running. Um, I'd like to say a few things about him, because um, he personally helped me through a lot of stuff. So I think he's a good candidate because he has race awareness. And what I mean by that, there's a lot of racial disparities in the hospitals that I dealt with personally, <coughs> along with me and a couple other people of my color who had dealt with, with social workers in DCF and not following guidelines. And Jake went to the extreme to reach out to councils and um, to write newspapers and people on blogs to make this aware that this, these things are happening. That, um, and as you were saying, a lot of uh, nurses are leaving because they are placed in a situation where they just want to be good people. And they are in here with a bunch of people who are being not great people and 
I dealt with a lot of racial stuff personally myself. Um, Jake is mission driven. He's a creative problem solver. And everything I've seen here, I've seen for with my own eyes. He's invested in relationships. Um, he demonstrates integrity. Um, he has a vision. He's teamwork, willingness to learn. He communicates very well. He's self-motivated, um, culture aware. He has integrity. He's dependable. He has goals, and he's driven. Um, he's just not. He goes to the extreme under the ground. When people say things like, "Oh, this is um, so not great. We should do something about it," they do nothing about it. Jake takes that next step, and. Um, I know for a fact that he has a lot of schoolwork to do, and I've been taking up so much of his time because he makes a difference. This one guy here made a difference with a lot of people because a lot of people are just not aware. They are afraid. They are afraid to step up. They feel like this is wrong. This shouldn't happen, but they don't. They don't um, express that voice. And Jake says, "Screw that. I'm gonna. I'm gonna take this voice and I'm gonna go with it. This is happening, and it's happening right now. And something needs it." Um, happened about it. Um, he's just an all-around great guy. I love him to death. And I will vote for him, and I will make signs to have everybody vote for him, because this man is the man for the job, because he would not let it go. If it's something, no funding, we're going to find it. I don't care if he out here with a lemonade stand, he's going to get it, because he's that driven. You have no idea. Like, you have anything going on that's really important that no one's listening to you about? After this meeting, you talk to him. And I'm serious. He is going to go all the extreme to you. He cares about the elderly. He cares about children. He cares about the way people are um, representing themselves and not doing their job. Like, for example, I went through something personally with DCF, the primary children family, where I had a diabetic um, attack. and. Um, they took my five-month-old baby out the house and assumed it was some drugs. Just because I'm black, and I'm saying it, so this is a fact, uh, it was drugs. I went to the hospital, everything was taken care of, the drugs was not the issue, I was not on any drugs. And um, they were just like, oh, what do we do now? Let's invent a story. Uh, but Jake was like, no, that's not gonna happen. I'm gonna write this person, that person, I'm going to Waterbury, I'm going to Montpelier, we're gonna make this right, and he did. So, um, like I said, he's the man for the job because he would not let it go. So, that's all I have to say. Don't want to take up too much time, but, yes. Thank you. And what are you running for? Yeah, so maybe I should go back. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're sold, but what's the job? <laughs> Trump rule. Yeah, thank you, Kat, for announcing my candidacy. Um, so, yeah, I was, I started conversations this summer with different folks. Um, uh, notifying people and kind of learning about the process. Um, I think that I have reached a point in my life where I'm ready and I think the community has a need that I can fill. Um, so I am stepping up and I am now announcing my candidacy for the East District Council seat. Um, thank you very much for your support, Kat. Um, yeah, uh, I'll, I won't go through my whole resume, but I'll tell you that I have lived in Burlington my entire adult life, so for the past 13 years. Um, mostly downtown. Uh, in 2018, I moved to Ward 7, and I have now been in Ward 1 for the past year. Um, so s I'll give you my professional history since the beginning of the pandemic. When the pandemic started, I said, you know, I, I can't sit at home for 12 to 18 months because, you know, everybody who says they didn't know how long it was going to last Tony Fauci was saying 12 to 18 months from day one. So I was listening and I was hearing that and I was saying, I'm not gonna sit at home for 12 to 18 months. So um, I worked with uh, Liz Curry and some folks at the state um, and helped stand up the COVID recovery center for folks with housing insecurity who needed a place to quarantine and isolate safely. Um, after that was stood up, um, I transitioned and worked with CBOEO to help set up the hotel housing assistance program. Um, and I ended up working at the Holiday Inn for 12 months. Um, during that time, I you know, was helping folks in mental health and other forms of crisis when there was no one to call. Um, you know, we could call the police and we could call the ambulance, but for mental health, there was no first call. Um, there was no emergency evaluations to be done in the emergency department. So, um, you know, I have that experience of dealing with crisis and emergency situations. 
after that position, I became an EMT. Um, after working as an EMT, I have spent the past summer working with People's Kitchen, and I'm currently helping my friend Kat, and I'm also um, working on creating an organization so that we can have a community-owned and operated food truck for nonprofits, um, feeding folks, things like that. Uh, I would love your support because I believe that there are a lot of reasons why individuals in our community are currently experiencing despair. Um, and we don't need folks to be in despair. We are a strong community. We got through the pandemic so well because of our strength. And I think that we can build on these strengths. We can build bridges. We can work with our state representatives and our state senators, and we can do better. Um, this divisiveness that we're seeing in local politics, that doesn't need to be happening. That's reflective of the national politic, but that's not how we do things here, and I think that we can do better. Um, I'm working with my friend Infinite on his campaign, so I'd love to turn it over to him, and then maybe we can be done with the politics, folks. <laughs> Thank you, Jake. Uh, my name is Infinite, Cole Kleasure. I live in the old North End. I've also been here for most of my adult life uh, for about 30 years now. Um, worked at Spectrum Youth and Family Services for a few years, um, and for the past decade have spent, uh, well, almost a decade, about nine and a half years, working with Voices for Vermont's Children um, as a community organizer and policy advocate. So I am, uh, t have been technically a lobbyist for children and families um, in the state house, um, as you know, uh, uh, I guess a, a, a vocation, so to speak, um, and and as well as a community organizer with families who have children in the Burlington School District and Winooski School District. So I've gotten to see both sides, um, you know, working with folks on the ground with families and students in the in the. Bronson and Winooski schools, and I've also had the opportunity to uh, advocate for not just uh, new bills, but specific provisions in some bills, like the literacy bill that just came out, um, community schools bill. Um, I am a member of the Act One Working Group uh, for Ethnic Studies and Social Equity in Schools, um, and so I've been doing that for the past couple of years and did a lot of work on um, the education quality standards around literacy in that document. Um, and, you know, I have to say, uh, it, you know, I've had the opportunity to sit at the feet of uh, people who have been working in the legislative legislature for decades. Um, you know, uh, some mentors of mine who have uh, really kind of walked me through the legislative process, which sometimes a little can be a little opaque, right? Um, you know, you uh, a bill comes from the house, you know, as a kind of a uh, uh, you know a template, and then it gets to the Senate, and it has all these new items in it um, without very much uh, public input, right? And so it's coming from you know people, you know, like myself sometimes, you know, as a you know so-called uh, lobbyist at the state, you know. Um, special interests that they sometimes call, call us, and sometimes just from people who are sitting in the Senate um, who have you know, their own ideas around you know, how bills should go. Um, needless to say, you know, I don't see a lot of engagement um, of the public with our legislative process, and that's really something that I want to bring uh, to Montpelier as a state senator representing Chittenden County as an independent. So I'm the the tortoise in this race, <laughs> right? Um, and that's okay, uh, because, you know, as an organizer, I do see some openings after the redistricting being able to canvas from the new North End to, to Essex Junction, right? Um, in Burlington, it stops at Maple Street, uh, at the south of Maple Street, and so um, luckily for me, I won't have to I try to convince Wards Five and Six, <laughs> you know, to, to to be on my side, um, but that but but that's okay too because you know I don't I, I'm not sure how the districts were divided, um, but I do feel like you know I would be representing you know as much as Chittenden County as possible. Chittenden Central happens to be 
the most diverse district in the state of Vermont, right? And, you know, and, and the most uh, dense uh, district in the state of Vermont. Um, as far as legislative priorities, you know, I, I've seen a lot of bills pass um, and then just kind of, uh, we, we move on to the next bill. And so I'm really curious about the implementation phases of some of these bills as they're going into, you know, into play. Uh, in particular, we have um, uh, passed a bill to uh, create an office of, you know, a public advocate office for children and families. Um, and I think that's something that we have to really watch closely because we really want um, that office to have, um, you know, some, some, some power and some authority, you know, to uh, uh, look out for children and families. Um, the uh, community schools bill only targeted five schools. I think we, you know, we should we should expand that bill. The literacy bill needs to be um, very, uh, 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 you know, watched very closely in the implementation process. Half of Vermont's K through 12 children are not reading at grade level. Half, half, and then when you break it down um, by ethnicity and race. Um, and disability, um, the numbers get even uh, more tragic. So we do have a, lit a, a literacy um, crisis. And, and Martine is right. We also have this, I think, this environmental justice issue with our school building. Um, my hope is that we don't focus so much on uh, the building that we don't forget about the underlying issues that that kids are facing, families, kids and families are facing um, in our education system. Our teachers are being asked to do way too much. Um, we have a power shortage right now. Um, it, it is, it's, it's really, I mean, you know, talking to school workers, not just teachers, but school workers, it's, it's really sad. Um, you know, having gone through a teaching licensing program half this year and then stopping short because I was talking to elementary school teachers who were saying, you know what, Infinite, uh, this might not be the time for you to come into the classroom uh, because uh, we're doing, you know, we're really struggling right now um, in the classroom. And so if there's anything else <laughs> you, you have on your, you know, your bucket list, you know, you might, you might want to wait on this one. So. Um, my email address, if anyone's interested in contacting me, is i.culcleas, as in Sam, U-R-E, at gmail.com. Um, Jake <laughs> graciously accepted to be my treasurer. <laughs> so, you know, uh, everything, you know, everything that was said about him is true. You know, he's really uh, stretching himself uh, to try um, and help you know, build the capacity of folks who, you know, haven't done this before. Although this is not my first rodeo, I did run for mayor um, back in 2018. <laughs> and uh, we got lucky in one award. We, <laughs> we got lucky and won a whole award, uh, that being, you know, uh, Ward 8. Um, and we hope to, you know, get that lucky again, right? Um, so thank you for your time and thank you for the invitation. Um, hopefully I'll be back next month. So um, first of all, can I say something about, um, for all the people that are here that are running, if they have any campaign literature, it would be great to leave some so that, because no, I didn't write down any of your emails or contact info. Um, so that would be wonderful. Um, and I, I was a city councilor and I was an independent. And so it's not easy when you're not affiliated with one of the major parties. Um, so I wish you very well. Mm -hmm. And I do remember you because I listened to the mayoral debates and I thought you did an excellent job. So I'm just going to state that. So very good. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, my name is Sharon Busher and um, I'm still alive even though there's a room named after me. So. <laughs> That's a big deal actually. Yes. <laughs> So um, I came for two reasons. One, Jonathan mentioned, because although I don't live on North Prospect, I wondered what the heck was going on with the, the construction that was never ending and never seeming to have anybody ever working there either. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to understand that. So I reached out 
to DPW to find out today, and um, and uh, and Jonathan shared that he had been reaching out too, and I think both of us feel like we can understand problems, but if you don't communicate those problems, it's really hard to um, live with those and understand that there is going to be a a timeline and hopefully a completion date. Um, so I'm not going to say any more about that because Jonathan covered that. I'm here because I, although I'm no longer a city councilor, I am a political junkie and I can't let go of it. Um, and so I have, I am what I call a ghost councilor. I sign in and I've attended every single city council meeting since I lost my election. And I don't always talk, but I'm finding my voice again. Unfortunate for all of you. But anyways, um, so one thing that I have tried to do is, is to really try to keep involved in issues that I think are important to the community or our ward. And one thing that is about to happen is the rezoning of Trinity Campus by the University of Vermont. And this item is now before the Planning Commission. And um, I've been following that um, with UVM's presentation. But it came to my, I became aware that none of the Planning Commissioners had ever been to the site. And so I asked for a site visit. And that, unfortunately, happened yesterday in the rain. Oh, wow. um, but having said that, I. There's still some value. Um, the problem, and if any of you um, don't know, that you know, Trinity Campus has opportunity to add some additional housing. And we all know we need housing. And the idea that we all hope that, to embrace is the fact that if the University of Vermont can create some housing that could retain some of the juniors and seniors on campus, maybe also attract graduate students who currently live in the community. Not that we don't welcome them all, but we have a housing crisis and a shortage. And if we could have more housing and some of that dedicated for these people during their educational years, we would all benefit from that. So they want, so UVM wants to rezone Trinity Campus to allow to create more housing. Um, some of that, so it's, it's 20 acres, but there's a steep slope behind, and, and we, we're not, California was smarter than we were, and I, I tried when I first got elected to deal with not having sloped land that you can't build on count as part of the acreage, and so, um, like it or not, that means that you can develop more densely on a smaller parcel even though, because some of the land isn't develop, developable. Um, having said that, so they have 20 acres, but not all acres are you, you're able to develop. So they want to put in, they have setbacks, and so setbacks from Colchester Avenue. One setback is, if you're familiar with the buildings, there's this big, if you go in the driveway where the light is, there's a white house, it's called the Villa. But to the left of that is a big brick, looks like a school. Um, and that is Man Hall. And that is um, 150 feet back from Colchester Avenue. And that was the setback that was put in place. So you couldn't build closer. So UVM is asking that that setback get adjusted um, to 110 feet from the Colchester Avenue, and that would allow buildings that could be up to um, 80 feet. Um, and that seems appropriate to me, uh, and the feedback, not many people have been following this, I must admit, um, but it seems appropriate to me, and I think that there's space, there's a map, unfortunately I, I didn't make copies, but they, if you go on to the Planning Commission website and the agenda for last night, I believe you can find this map, um, but it will show where they plan to put a structure like this. They're planning to put in around 400 beds, but then they also want to put in housing closer to Colchester Avenue in the, in the green space. Initially, they wanted to put it 25 feet from the sidewalk. 
I've taken a lot of time, done my homework, gone to Redstone. Anyways, I've got them to now say that it will be 45 feet from the sidewalk. I didn't want to have us walled in and feel a tunnel effect, nor do I think it's great if you live right on top of a busy road. I, I think your quality of life is compromised. I, I'm not a planner, but that's how I feel. So anyways, they're going to set that back to 45 feet. And those housing, those units are supposed to be for grad students. Um, this is still in planning. I don't agree with everything that I just shared with you, although I do support the 80, the 80 feet and the housing that they're going to create. I don't really support um, the housing closer to the road. And I can go through the fact that there are surface parking lots which I think they could build over and still maintain that parking and still create the housing they need. And I would prefer to see that go first before they take green space. Um, so having said that, it's in planning. Planning meets on Tuesdays. And they, meet, they met, met last night. And they're going to meet in two weeks in November, and, and I think in two weeks they will have a proposal that they can chew upon. So if anybody, they meet at 6.30, you can go by Zoom, you don't have to go to the meeting. Oftentimes you can't meet with them, it, it, most of the time it's remote. Um, but you can hear the presentation, you, there's a public forum, they're very willing to allow people to weigh in um, and make comments either in support or raise questions. Um, and I believe that they hope to either um, bring forward some more questions and fine tune the zoning amendment or actually uh, vote on it and then move it forward for public hearing. And just if all of you people don't know that because I'm a political junkie, if they move it to a public hearing, I just want you to know, you'll have a chance to speak then. Then if they then can need to act and send it to the city council, where it would go to the city council ordinance committee because it's a zoning amendment. So there will be opportunities for everybody who have a, hasn't uh, taken the time or had the time um, to, to get involved, to look at it and say, hey, I want to weigh in, the, weigh in on this or not. Um, so I know I've taken a lot of time, but I think it's an important um, proposal. I think that Richard Cape, the vice president, was there last night um, and was asked directly um, if indeed he thought this housing would provide relief to our community. And he said he could not guarantee that, and he wasn't sure, um, which is a safe answer. Um, but I think he's right. I think he's right because there's They've done their own internal surveys, and juniors and seniors do not want to live on campus for any number of reasons. Um, um, the type of housing, the, the restrictiveness, the fact that who wants to live in a dorm when you can live in your own apartment. So that's it. And thank you so much. And it's good to see everybody in person in the flesh. So. Sorry, Susie. Um, maybe next Tuesday. They met last yesterday, and they'll meet in two weeks. Two weeks. In two weeks. So, um, at 6 p.m. and where? 6.30. 6 and it's, it's, it, usually it's remote, so you have to, you go on the um, agenda, the city um, website, and the meeting agenda, and then if you click on Planning Commission at 6.30, it will expand, and there's a link that you can get right into Zoom. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Sharon. Yep. Who else would like to speak? One Karen. One thing. I know you're running. That, that's quite all right. I think we're going to. Um, this is Hi. good. And um, it, it, first of all, it's good. Second of all, I'm not going to be facilitating like next month or the month after that. So, and the, you know, Tom is not going to let people go on like this. So, speak on. I'm a <laughs> okay. um, so, and, and so we're going to. What, what I think we're going to do is we're going to take the, the bylaws and put them up till next month. And okay. then give people the opportunity to speak now, um, all around in, on, the, on, the, on the big screen and in the room. So go ahead. I have please. to go to the meeting at eight. I'm sorry to have to run out. Thank you, Brian. Bye. Thanks, Brian. Um, one thing I wanted to say is um, a message from Jared Wood, my neighbor, who also talked to Jonathan about this. He thinks that there should be a for every stop sign, there should be a stop line. Yeah. Meaning. A place where the car should stop. I guess that was it. 
So anyway, I wanted to say that he and I share the frustration that many, many, many cars don't stop at stop signs. Um, he's a walker. I'm a walker and a biker, and it happens all the time. You just have to be careful because they tend to cruise right through. But I also have a question on streets. Willard has, you know, um, Willard is a state highway. And so they repaved it, but they did not level the, you know, manholes or even the side streets the like Loomis. Mm -hmm. What is it? So what happened, they, they're going to come back and do a second course of mm -hmm. paving and they wait so that engineering things that we don't understand can happen. Okay, so they are coming back. Yeah. yeah. Okay. They do like precise measurements. They might okay, because it's things. really, it's been a while since they like abandoned yeah. the project yeah. and yeah. no one has come back and it just seems, it is very dangerous, especially on a bicycle if you hit one of those. Um, so anyway, that was all. Well, thank you. I just wondered what happened. Yeah. Like, did they run out of money and they just quit or what happened? With asphalt in the summer and it heat, it makes it so it does its um, get hard like it should. So it kind of dips and dips. Same with sidewalks. So they wait in it for it to settle. Come I see. And then they come back. Because, yeah, they need to yeah. level it up with, like, <laughs> Loomis and, you know, like the side streets that they go into. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And that was all. Yeah. 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 Thank, thank you, and, and, and I appreciate you bringing that up, uh, Jared's concern, and I wanted to ask the group a question, and this is just, it's just kind of a general poll. Uh, he's very serious about this, and, it's, and it, it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so if you think about, uh, if you think about the, the, the paint on the, on the road and you think about street signs, they're all the same. It's signage for drivers. Um, the, the line on the road is really a sign for drivers, whereas the stop sign is a sign for everybody. Would, how, can, can I just have a general show of hands, and you can use that little hand button if you're on Zoom, um, if you think that as a ward, we should write a letter about this and uh, send it to DPW or bring it to the city council. Pretty simply saying, uh, and, 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 and as I was talking to, to Jared about it, it, it occurred to me that, um, you know, if a if a stop sign gets knocked down, the city will put it back up, and they'll put it back up pretty quickly because it's a it's a safety hazard. Um, the same goes for that line. The line serves the same purpose, but it, it makes absolutely sure the cars stop at the intersection rather than halfway through it or some other place. Um, so, is this something that as a as a ward we should you know just a, a simple show of hands and don't feel bad if you don't think it's a good idea. You don't have to wait, raise your hand, but. But uh, is this, you know, if we wrote something up and then voted on it next month and then maybe sent it to DPW, is that something people might want to do? And I would encourage that they start enforcing stopping and stop signs. Because I know that's something they don't do and for years. Uh, I don't even know how you're a John Yara, like, chief, acting chief, whatever he's called now. He just says they just don't do that. But I think they need to. They used to. That, that, and that is a separate issue. I, mean, I know. It's a political piece rather but, than safety. But anyway, that, well, that's a safety piece. It is a safety piece. If we're going to have a line, what's the point of having a line if there's nobody that's it. going to enforce that people stop the line? Right. I mean, that's it. OK, yeah. I'm seeing enough. I saw enough hands that, I, that maybe the steering committee can write something up, and we can talk about it next month, um, see whether it goes forward from there. Who else would like to speak? I, um, who else? Let's let's just go to the screen. Are there? Carol. The Sarah. No. Carol. Yeah. Me. Me. Carol. Can I? Carol. I don't mind. <laughs> Carol. Carol. So um, I just wanted to let you know about other candidates. Um, they were all. I can't see you. I can't see you. Okay, I can stand up too. Um, all the candidates who are invited to to just introduce themselves informally tonight. Um, so Tanya Vahovsky, um was not able to come, uh, Phil Baruth was not able to come, um, and so Tanya, Philip, uh, Martine, and Infinite are all running for the three Senate seats, okay? And you're probably, hopefully you're aware of that. Um, Troy Hedrick was not able to come, um, Brian um, did come, obviously, the, they're the two that are, are running as our representatives, and, and we get two of them, so they're unopposed. 
Um, so we continue to ask people to come to this time during Speak Out. So hopefully um, you'll hear from uh, Tanya and Troy and Philip um, next time. I also, um, Dan Hill was not able to be here. He's on your agenda. Um, I don't know, Sam, if you can show that um, handout. Um, so Dan Hill is the traffic manager for the city, and um, he's really concerned about trying to fill the crossing guard positions. Um, there are 17 open positions. Um, and we have several copies of this if you're, if you're interested. Um, so there are, obviously, there, there are the shifts, there's the pay, um, and then what they provide as well as the, the training um, and what's expected. So um, please consider doing this. Um, it's, it's a really important need that needs to be filled. Um, and we don't have um, 17 places in the city um, where kids are crossing the street. Um, we don't have coverage. Yes, Sharon. What I, this has bothered me, but it's been going on for quite a while. And do we know what they're doing? Like are principals going out to help kids cross or what's happening? How are, I mean, if we've got all these spots that don't have crossing guards, mm -hmm. what, what's going on? Yeah, I, I don't are, know. I think Dan, I mean, would, Dan would be the person to address yeah, that. And I, I think that when he, when he comes or however, I think I would respectfully ask the steering committee to ask them how how we're how we're providing a safe crossing for children okay. during this time because okay. it's really troubling me okay all right Thanks. we will do that thank you so that's it for me john thank, thank you thanks carol who else would like to speak in our extended speak out so carol yeah may i ask so did um brian is is running again correct Brian Sheena, yes. Okay, and who was the other person? Troy Hedrick. Okay. Okay, and they're both, they were, we have two seats, so they're both <coughs> unopposed. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Oops, two minutes. Thank you. Christopher. Uh, Christopher McCandless, and uh, I live, as I said, across the street, and I'm also for the last. <coughs> 37 years been the person primarily responsible for the buildings on this property and, and caring for them and trying to encourage community groups to use them. So I'm delighted that you all are here tonight. Um, I have two concerns that I don't, I'd like to have a group like this consider going forward. One is that as someone who lives on Prospect Street, I have been struck by the reduction in traffic that has been caused by the construction down at the other end of Prospect Street. People drive past my house at 40 and 50 miles an hour regularly. Uh, the number of broken mirrors that I have counted over the last 30 years on this side of Prospect Street defies description, um, especially when trucks and buses meet each other. Um, so, I have wondered whether there's ever been any consideration of turning Prospect Street into a one-way street. <laughs> yes. Jonathan wrote it. And uh, I, <laughs> I just raised that as a question. My second thought is that in my entire voting life, I have never failed to support uh, a school bond issue or a, a, a tax, an increase in taxes for schools. Um, but during um, the reassessment process that happened, my taxes went up by $3,400, which was a bit of a shock. Um, and now I'm led to believe that were I to vote for this school bond, they will probably go up another $1,800. And uh, I, I don't know what to do. I feel, um, I, I feel at a sort of moral crossroads. Uh, and so I invite conversation about that, not necessarily tonight, but um, I'm feeling like maybe for the first time in my life, I need to think about what the implications are of, of uh, I know that we need a new school. There's no doubt about that. Um, I don't quite understand why there aren't more federal government funds available or being sought for this project, um, but, I am worried about the implication on my family for what is 
what is needed. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. And we do have on the, we do have this on the agenda for later. So it, Good. there will be Q and A at that point. And um, thank you for the input. Other people who want to speak. I, I, if Angie wants to talk, she got her hand up a little while ago. And then, and, One is in response to Sharon, something that you said. First of all, we miss you terribly. And when we're in your room, I keep looking around like, we're Sharon. So it's a delight to have you back here. And I'm very happy to hear you speak, because you've always spoken um, with a lot of wisdom and thought. And that means a lot in a community <coughs> that isn't always what happens these days, as you know. So, um, one is to thank you, and another is to address an issue that you spoke about, which was the Trinity campus. And I want to say just very generally that I have been hugely frustrated by the, um, by the city and the university being at forever loggerheads about what to do about the housing problem in the city. And I, it just feels as if there's some unspoken agreement mm -hmm. that they're not ever going to talk about. It. And that we, the members of the community, who we're fine with having some college students in our community, but it's making, diff it's making it very difficult for people who have of limited means to get a toehold in our beautiful city of Burlington, Vermont, which we would love to have. Um, so i just like to say I'm delighted to hear about Trinity Campus. I'm delighted to hear that they're planning more beds. I'm not so delighted to hear that Vermont just accepted, the University of Vermont just accepted the largest freshman class in history. And Will they be able to house them? I, I don't know, but I just want to bring that that point up, that I wish the university and the city would actually talk with each other about what the crisis it is for um, individuals, for our community, that so many students have to live off campus. The other thing that I want to address, and I will make it short, um, has to do with the amount of dissension in the community, and many of speak people have spoken about this tonight, the amount of dissension in the community about public safety. And in our neighborhood up here, it's become a little tenuous and nerve-wracking. And I want to say that our city, there were city councilors some of whom were ours, who made a very quick decision in 2020 to, and I won't say defund the police, because those are, those words are poison, but our police department has been decimated by actions that the city council took without really anticipating what could happen as a result of their quick actions. And what has happened is that the police force is A, decimated, B, discouraged, and, you know, doesn't have such a great reputation as a place to work. We need police officers. We respect police officers. I do. And I, um, what I want to say is that there is a lot of anger and dissension in the community about that which happened in 2020, which is painfully trying to be rectified. I think that a simple acknowledgement or even an apology by the <coughs> council members who acted too quickly without thinking a, an acknowledgement that they may have taken um, 
an ill-advised step, I personally think that that would help in the amount of anger and stress we feel in this community. That I'd like to hear somebody say, uh, we, we acted too quickly. It wasn't right. We're going to try to do better. We're sorry. I know that one of our city councilors has reached out and taken some actions, and I appreciate that um, Zarai has done that. I'm very sorry that she isn't here tonight so that I could say that to her personally. I wish she were here tonight. So I think, of course I could go on, because I always could. <laughs> but I um, want to thank you for the opportunity for speaking up both about the mess of the university and the mess of the people who argue about the police, who we need as um, to remind us as deterrence and um, to be civil uh, members of our community and to remember to respect each other again, which I think we've lost. Thank you. Who else would like to speak? Maybe one more person so we can pretend to get back on the agenda. I'll keep it short. Sure. Go ahead. All right. Well, yeah, I just want to say, I mean, there's a bunch of things that folks brought up that um, i got to get <clears throat> more regularly. Um, yeah, on my way here, I was going on uh, Mansfield Ave and Colchester right there, like taking the right up to that like shared use path, and someone like rolled right through the line, like was, I don't think was looking, because I was in the bike lane there, and I was like, that's cool, and just dug over, and it was fine, but literally just happened. Um, that always happens. I bike to work down that, like where you go through, um, was it Winooski and, uh, yeah, where they're repaving there, and like, hit that, uh, <laughs> that, that manhole cover this morning, which was, oh, well, good morning. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was not great. Um, yeah. The, uh, yeah, the other thing I was going to mention was just, I am, Carol had said that there needed some help on, on the NPA steering committee, um, and I've been trying to carve out time for a couple of years now to try to be more active in NPA stuff. Um, third part-time job that I have um, <laughs> finally is wrapping up. Um, so I'm stopping some like remote jobs in New Hampshire. Um, and so, yeah, I'm really interested if, if help is needed. Um, if folks will have me, I'd, I'd, like, to, I'd like to help out. Um, yeah, and I guess that's, that's all I got. Great. Thank you, Carter. Um, we We'll, we can talk. We can talk next month about the, the bylaws, but we would well. We would welcome. The steering committee is certainly welcome you on the steering committee. It's a matter of the, the community vote. The NPA would vote on it, um, but we definitely need the support. Let's move on to the next item on the agenda. Uh, we're going to skip the bylaws. I will probably post links again in front porch forum once or twice before the next meeting, and then we can go through it. Um, and, I, and I think we all, what I did was, uh, the bylaws themselves are only three pages long, they're not too long, but I also created a, a PowerPoint presentation which summarizes them. It's like the net of the net, and then I could do the net of the net of the net too if you wanted. Um, but just so that next month maybe we can just go through them and, and move on. That's because Ward 1, short, shortly to be changed, but Ward 1 does not have a set of bylaws for the NPA. Um, Next on the agenda is the uh, Charter Change Committee um, about legal resident non-citizen voting. And Councillor Travers, you're here to talk about that, I think, right? That's right. Excellent. Thank you. you all right? Yes, we can hear. Okay, great. Uh, so thanks very much for having me. Uh, my name is Ben Travers. I represent Ward 5 uh, on the City Council, uh, newly elected a few months ago. Um, sorry I can't be there with you in person this evening. I have uh, child care duties here at home. Um, my youngest go to uh, preschool at, at Full Circle Preschool, which is connected to Mojave Sedic Synagogue Harris. So I'm driving down North Prospect Street uh, every morning and afternoon to the extent I can as of late. Uh, consider Ward 1 to sort of be my home away from home because of the kids in preschool there. Um, I've always been curious about the meeting house, so I'm sorry to uh, not be able to be there in, in person uh, to see it, but I'm glad to see it virtually over the screen. Um, I'm here 
together tonight uh, in my role as uh, one of three members of the City Council Charter Change Committee. Um, this is my second City Council meeting of the evening. I had one earlier on in the uh, Sharon Busher, very much alive. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, and here we are now meeting with you all. Um, the other true. members of the Charter Change Committee are uh, Dean Bergman uh, and Sarah Carpenter. And uh, we as a committee uh, have endeavored to go around to all the NPAs as part of a broader community engagement session uh, to talk about the fact that, that we have been tasked uh, with looking into as a committee uh, whether to put a ballot question uh, on the uh, town meeting day ballot again in March uh, with respect to all resident voting. Uh, and the uh, measure that we're looking at, uh, we, defer, we, we define uh, a, a legal resident as, as someone who's not otherwise uh, able to register to vote. They are a legal resident here, but they are a non-U.S. citizen. Uh, this is a matter that uh, was on the ballot, some of you may recall, in Burlington in 2015. Uh, and uh, was voted down on the ballot at that time. The City Council uh, considered uh, back in 2020 uh, whether to put this matter back on the ballot again, uh, but at that time that the Council elected against it, um, and it was at least in part at that time, I wasn't on the Council, but I certainly recall the discussion around it, um, concern about uh, whether we had really put the time in to engage the community, to inform them uh, about uh, the work that's going on and to answer any questions that there may be, um, particularly from folks who will be impacted the most by this, which are uh, non-U.S. citizens who uh, would gain an opportunity to register to vote in, in local elections. And uh, they, they understandably have had and will continue to have a lot of questions surrounding the matter. Um, so if I could just provide you know, sort of a very high-level overview of what this would do. Uh, is again, uh, if uh, Burlington voters uh, voted in favor of this in, in March, um, the proposal would uh, allow uh, non-U.S. citizens in, in Burlington over the age of 18 uh, to register to vote in local elections. So what would that mean is they could vote uh, for officers, such as city councilors, for the school board, for uh, ward clerks and inspectors of election, and of course for the mayor. Uh, and they would be uh, able to vote on uh, local questions, uh, such as future charter change measures, or uh, school bond votes, or other measures that are uh, unique um, to the Burlington ballot. Um, we've been working very closely uh, with Jillian Manton, uh, who works in uh, CEDO, uh, works very closely with a program uh, that's relatively new to CEDO, called the Trusted Community Voices Program, uh, that's been uh, working with uh, Burlington's diverse communities uh, to uh, relay to them the work that we're doing, the potential that this may be before voters uh, in March. Uh, for folks who are interested and want additional information, uh, we've put up a website, which is at burlingtonbt.gov slash allresidentvoting, and I'd be happy to uh, send you that link if you'd like to put it into the minutes. I'm very grateful that Jillian and Cito, when you go there, there's an FAQ page, uh, which has been translated into uh, multiple different languages uh, for folks who may uh, require that and learning more about it. Um, and uh, well, we are out there uh, to let folks know about this work um, before moving ahead as a committee and then ultimately as a council. Um, I'll make a couple other points here and then would be happy to answer any questions you all have, um, which is that uh, among the things that have changed since 2015, uh, when Burlington voters uh, voted a similar measure down, um, is at that point in time, Burlington would have been one of the first in the state uh, to take this measure. Uh, but since then, uh, both Montpelier uh, and Winooski uh, have proceeded to uh, stand up all resident voting with um, quite a bit of success. Uh, in, in Winooski, since this was put into effect, a few dozen um, folks who were not otherwise eligible to vote uh, have, uh, have registered to vote, and, uh, and nearly all those individuals who, who registered to vote uh, came out and, and voted in uh, their last election. So uh, that's a very promising sign. Uh, there was some concern about whether or not, uh, because this is a charter change, uh, the state legislature and ultimately the governor uh, would sign off on these measures, and what we've seen in Montpelier and what we've seen in uh, Winooski is that not 
notwithstanding some historical reservations, we've heard from folks in Montpelier uh, that uh, these charter changes were permitted uh, and have gone into effect. Um, and uh, we've, we've been working actually very closely with folks from One News in particular, including uh, Mayor Lott, uh, to learn about what their process has been and, and, uh, and uh, try to get over any growing pains now um, before we put this before the voters. Um, so that is where we are at right now uh, as a committee. Uh, again, uh, this should be, uh, well, if the committee votes this out, which I anticipate it will, uh, it will be heard before the full council, and then ultimately as a matter that will be on the ballot in March. And if folks have any questions or comments, uh, I'd be happy to take them to answer them. And if, for any reason, I don't know the answer at this point in time. Sometimes those are the best questions, and, and I will be taking those back to the committee and get answers back to you all. Who has questions? Dan, let me just ask you, um, what, has, what has the committee gleaned from the people that would now have an opportunity to vote? I can't imagine that it is, isn't all positive. Um, but, I mean, the point that at, it was Councillor Roof who was going to move this in 2020 and then pulled it because there was some criticism that the, the community wasn't well informed about this this um, and that it was premature to move it without doing that that legwork. So ha has there been any insights? I know that one of the counselors um, that c still serves felt very strongly about the need for people to be citizens before they they had a chance to exercise their right to vote. Um, but but that was the only that was the only statement that I recall in 2020. So can you give a synopsis of what you've gleaned from the community? Sure. Thank um, you. Thank you for that question, Sharon. Um, so as, as far as I know, at least from folks who are on the council, uh, uh, as it stands right now, I've, I've not heard that same concern at this point in time, at least with respect to um, sort of preserving citizenship as being uh, a, a requirement to vote in, in any election. I will tell you um, that that is something that I've heard from folks in my ward and, and, and from folks throughout the city. The committee has received that feedback from some folks who, who really believe that uh, voting should, should be a privilege of, of citizenship and that folks um, who uh, are not citizens um, should, should not be uh, awarded that privilege, for lack of a better term. Um, it's not an opinion that, that I personally share, um, but we have heard that feedback. Um, from my own perspective, I think particularly over the last uh, couple of years or so, uh, I think folks are, are rightly so taking a look at democracy and the importance of participating in that democracy uh, in a different light uh, than we were uh, back in 2015 when Burlington voters looked at this the first go around. So, that's where I stand on it, but we have heard that concern. Um, with respect to, again, those communities that obviously would be most impacted, which are those who would gain uh, the opportunity to register to vote in local elections, uh, generally speaking, I would say the responses that we've seen thus far have been positive, and folks are excited about the opportunity to participate in their local community. Uh, historically, uh, I think there's been some questions around the logistics of how this will work. You know, if you look at the state voter registration <coughs> form as an example, uh, you're required to enter in uh, a driver's license or personal ID number, uh, or if you don't have a driver's license, uh, you're required to enter a social security number. And of course, if you're not a U.S. citizen, you, you wouldn't have a social security number. So technically speaking, the application put out by the state would require uh, your having a driver's license or personal ID at least to uh, enter the number. And so there's, there's been some questions around some of those logistics and whether they would present hurdles uh, to certain folks having an opportunity to register. Uh, those are logistics that we're working with uh, the city clerk's office uh, to, to figure out if whether, uh, you know, I mean, Burlington uh, would have to uh, manage this process on its own because folks are, uh, uh, would only be registered to vote in local elections. It's not something that we would forward along to the 
state like we do with other applications for folks to be able to register for state elections. So, so we are working through some of those logistical hurdles that folks have rightly had questions about uh, how it would operate. But, but I don't anticipate them being uh, hurdles to our ultimately getting this done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wonder if we could just take a very quick five minutes for you. You're, you're also a member of the Redistricting Working Committee, right? Um, yes, I got, I got an email from Carol. I understand, unfortunately, uh, my colleagues in the council are, are, are not there tonight, so I certainly would be willing to provide feedback on the redistricting or uh, I'm mindful of your time this evening, but if folks have any other questions about the support of the council, I'd, I'd be open to answering that as well. But I'd certainly respect your agenda at the time. I'm just respecting the agenda tonight quite a lot, so don't worry about that. <laughs> um, but but it, I think if we can get this, the, the school district on at 8.30, we might be able to settle everything out. It would be fine. So if, if you could take five minutes to talk a little bit about where you think the working group is going and what are the big considerations, um, and then we can, send, we can send questions and suggestions to Zariah after that, or to you and Zariah. Right. Yeah, so um, I suspect many folks in, in the room there uh, and in there online are aware of this, but just uh, for the sake of, uh, uh, of a recap, uh, we heard some, from some folks during the public comment period about the fact that our House and Senate uh, districts were recently uh, redistricted at the state level uh, because of the recent census. Here at the local level, uh, we are also required uh, to uh, look at uh, redistricting Thank you. Will the, will the working group meetings be open meetings? Or yes, that was a discussion um, that came up last night. Uh, I, I think they have to be, right? I mean, now that the council sort of formally set up uh, this small group, uh, my, 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 my intention is that those meetings will now be more, and certainly folks who are interested would be more than open and how to welcome folks to come in. 
Okay, great. So that if people have questions or comments or input, that would be the place at this point that we should be providing it at those meetings. Uh, yeah, and I think that the benefit of the small group, right, is I think it's really going to be built as a, a working session to try to knock down some of the uh, formalities that you find before the council meeting and have these meetings be uh, working sessions and back and forth dialogue once the welcome for any input from the community. Good. Thank you very much. Um, and let's move on to the Burlington School District. I'd like to come on over and we, we, we left you a set of chairs. Oh, great. Or you, yeah. can, stand, or you can stand at the front of the room. Um, oh, no. It's, 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 it's the right. sitting hour, I think. Great. Good. Well, we very much appreciate your being here. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Kathy's here, too. You want to come up with us or do you want to stay where? There's three stay chairs. And if, and if you could just use this microphone for the um, recording. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll set this down. Okay. So that's good. And we do have a presentation. Yeah, I they're think gonna, we've got to gonna show it up. And okay, great. They'll, they'll pour or get us through the slides and we need to. Good evening, everybody. It's great to see you all. Uh, this is a great place. I've never I've seen it driving by to go to the office, but never been in here. It's a great place. I'm Tom Flanagan. I'm the superintendent uh, of Burlington Schools. And I'm Joe White. I'm with White and Burke Real Estate Advisors. Uh, our firm is the project manager uh, for this project. And I'm Kathy Alwald, the East District School Commissioner from Wards 1 and 8. Great. And we handed out a couple of um, pieces of paper for you. The first is a one-pager that we, where we tried to just get every bit of the biggest information or most important information in one place. And then we have a frequently asked questions document that is a companion to that. Um, we are not going to speak off of those exactly tonight, but we can take questions on those. Uh, we're going to talk off of the presentation. And Joe and I will go back and forth. We're available to, what, what we'll probably do is try to run through in about 10 minutes, and then we can open it for discussion, if that sounds okay to everybody. Yeah, good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> Thanks for having us. All right. Um, so, the first uh thing that we wanted to make sure that you knew about we'll go to slide first slide um is the project history uh of the of why why are we in this position where we need to build a burlington high school in burlington technical center uh by 2025 we're aiming for the august of 2025 and if we hit our timelines, we can meet that deadline, but it is a, an aggressive deadline, So, uh, but not one where we're hurrying either. So uh, we feel good about, about the timeline. Um, so the first thing is, uh, takes us back to um, 2020, even before 2020. We knew that the high school needed to be renovated seriously renovated um, in, I don't know, 2015, 14? Yes. Oh, we knew. Before that. But, yeah. Because it wasn't accessible, it didn't have, up, it needed major HVAC upgrades, it needed major, it needed windows, it needed um, a bunch of major upgrades just to be a school that was built for, um, to be accessible, really, and a, and a, and a space that is usable, um, and accessibility specifically related to individuals with disabilities, uh, because it's a series of different um, 
buildings with runways in between. There are lots of stairs and, and it's a really inaccessible building. Um, and so that was one of the issues. You can also see you know, accessibility, outdated learning spaces, failing mechanical systems. The building really desperately needed repair that was significant. And the, um, the, the people of Burlington, the citizens voted to approve a bond of $70 million for the renovations. Um, and that was called the re-envisioning re uh, project. As a part of that project, we started to look at the, we were required to look at the environmental condition of the building. And we learned that there were PCBs uh, that are a toxic chemical that has cancer causing, that is um, cancer and other health um, uh, impacting chemical, um, that that was in the, in the air. And then we learned pro right just prior to the start of the school year in 2020, um, which was actually the first day of my time as a super <laughs> superintendent here, literally the first day of school, uh, I got a call from the mayor's office actually because they got a call from the state saying the day before saying we're, we were going to need to shut the building down. And I was like, it was COVID. So I was thinking it was a COVID related thing. Um, and, and I didn't really know about PCBs, but we learned about those PCBs. We met with the EPA and the <clears throat> Department of Environmental Conservation. And um, we, what we, we learned from them that uh, the building needed to be closed so that we could better understand. We were waiting for, we got the first set of test results back and we were waiting for more test results from the air quality to come back. Uh, what we learned was that the air, the, the, from the EPA and the Department of Environmental Conservation that in a school building um, and sort of outside of a factory setting, these were the highest levels of PCBs that they'd ever seen in a building. Um, and so they're really, it was really significant. And they were really high in the F building, which is in the back. And they kind of got lower and lower in the air as they moved down, as you kind of moved down the hill. But still, even it, throughout the building, these PCBs exist. Um, and we learned that the, through, after the air quality testing, you have to then test building materials. And so we learned that those PCBs are in the ceiling, in the light ballast, so they're in the ceiling. They're in the glue that you put the tiles, that, that affix the tiles to the floor. And they're in the windows. And in each of those places, PCBs over time release. And so they, they have, they, they've gone into the foundation, of the, into the flooring, down in, and they've gone up to two feet uh, into the, the cement uh, around the windows. And so if you think about, and I've been, you, when we talk about the building, in some ways it's like a car that is totaled. If you look at the walls, the, the windows we would have to replace and two feet around the windows, except for the gym, if you look at most of the other buildings, that means there ends up being no more walls. Um, and we also have it in the floor. So at, at that point, it's, it really is, um, it's not salvageable uh, as, a, as a building anymore. Um, and so we borrowed that seven, we, we bonded for the $70 million, but we didn't borrow the $70 million. We used $4 million of the $70 million to understand the PCBs and deal with the PCBs, but we did not borrow, um, or we are not using the, the additional $66 million dollars from that bond. So that all just was either borrowed and given back or part of it was borrowed and given back and part of it was never borrowed. Um, and so that, that money just is, is, was never, never impacted uh, taxpayers beyond the, the four million that we used for the PCB to get to the point where we realized the PCBs were gonna not allow us to continue with that project. Um, and so I think that gets us, so that's the, that's the history that gets us to, to where we are. So we can go to the next slide. And, um, and then this speaks a little bit to where we, the more recent history. So the more recent history is we did a public engagement process around where the building should be. We looked at 
25 or so, a, a bunch of different sites around town, and we chose Institute Road. We did a survey uh, we, uh, of the community, and we got feedback from, our, from, the, from the experts that we work with, and it was clear that Institute Road, because we owned the land, and because uh, we were able to just build right, there was a space for us to build right on the land, it actually ended up being the least expensive, uh, or projected to be the least expensive and least complicated of options for us to build. And also a, 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 an option that many people, most people, uh, really preferred because of the campus feel, because of the fields that are there um, and, the, and the space that's available, the proximity to the bike path, the lake, the arms forest, and, and, every, and everything that that site offers. Um, once we chose that site, then we looked at five and a half. Um, five, it's, there was one that was, we looked at five, about five different designs. So the design team developed five different designs of what that building could look like. And, uh, and one of those designs had a point, had a, had a, had a uh, different uh, option to it. So that's why I said five and a half. We ended up choosing option C, which was the least expensive of the five options, and also the most energy efficient and the most efficient kind of use of space. So still allowing us to build a, a great building, uh, but also being as mindful as we can of the impact to our community, to taxpayers on, on this building. So we've done, we've been really working hard to balance at each step of the way, having a great space for learning, that is modern, that is accessible, that is flexible, that is connected to the woods and the bike path and the lake and the fields and creates flow and community um, and access for the community, um, but also that is not gonna, that is the most uh, mindful of impact, of the impact to taxpayers because we know that is significant. Um, so, we all, as we've moved, so you can see where the design sits, and we have some design pictures we'll show you in a minute, um, but um, you can see kind of the general design, so it's compact, um, and, but there is still some outdoor space, and there's lots of light and access and sight lines to the outdoors um, and, and common spaces, so you'll see some of that. Um, we did decide, a, half of the students, in, we have a Burlington High School, which is about, uh, which is um, 900 or so students. And we also have a Burlington Technical Center. Half of the students in the Burlington Technical Center are from Burlington. The other half are from the sending districts across the region. So nine different high schools can send their students to our technical center. So half is our students, half are from the region. And so we decided that we should build half of the Burlington Technical Center at the at the site here and we were fortunate that our aviation teacher um, and our and our technical center director applied for a grant uh, an earmark from senator Leahy, and received the award for 10 million dollars to build a program at the airport that is related to aviation and so we are able to move our aviate our two aviation programs advanced manufacturing, pre-tech, and probably auto um, and out to the airport. Um, and so that was just happened at the right time. And we ended up being able to pull $20 million out of the, of the project. Um, and, and we'll be able to use that 10 million plus other funding from the airport and from other support uh, to build that program at the airport. So we're really actually excited about that because it puts the technical center a little bit further into the region, a little closer to the sending districts, and also right next to the field where this work is happening with Beta, with the Vermont Flight Academy, with the the um, and the airport, all looking for people who have transferable skills, but all and also specific skills related to aviation. So it's a really good option uh, that we were just really fortunate that all it all came together at this time. Um, and so we also have, um, throughout this process, been looking for ways to, to secure funding. I'll talk a little bit more about that afterward, um, after Joe talks about the design. 
and um, but where we are now is that we have the school board approved a 165 million dollar bond request and that is an up to we really are committed to raising funds to get that 165 million dollars uh, to not have to borrow all of that and we're already making progress and I'll talk a little bit more about that mo the money part uh, later um, and and we're headed and City Council unanimously approved was supported the mayor this the bond placement on the ballot and now it that the bond language um, for this project will be on the November 8th ballot uh, and those mail home um, ballots are coming out in September probably around September 28th. So I'll pass it to Joe to talk through the schematic design. All right, thank you. So this slide shows our proposed site plan for the new high school and tech center uh, on the north side of Institute Road. So our, our plan is to demo and fully remediate the uh, contaminated buildings that, that currently exist on the site and then construct uh, a new 250,000 square foot uh, high school and tech center. Uh, the new building will be four stories. It'll be relatively compact in size to minimize environmental impact. And uh, as you can see, it's, it's pretty much centered on the site with an orientation to Institute Road. Access to the site will be from uh, Institute Road. And just to uh, highlight a few of the design features, there will be two main prominent entrances uh, to the new building, a south entrance and a north entrance. The south entrance will face uh, Institute Road, and the north entrance will serve the, the new parking area on the north side as well as uh, the bus uh, drop-off and pickup area back there. Uh, both entrances will provide access to a two-level student commons, which is being designed to pretty much be the heart and soul of this, the school and the hub of student activity. Uh, there will be a significant amount of seating and space uh, in this common area uh, for students to, d to dine, gather, and collaborate. Uh, the cafeteria will be on the first level of the, this student commons area. Uh, there will be a 750 seat auditorium uh, with balcony and a three station gym, uh, both of which will be accessed off the student commons. And uh, the third station of the gym will actually serve as a community gym uh, with a separate entrance that can be closed off from the remainder of the school so it can be used by the community uh, during evenings or, or on weekends. Uh, we're also proposing a strong connection to the outdoors, uh, as Tom had said earlier, which is something that we heard very loud and clear from the students and from teachers uh, as something that w is very important and highly desirable in the new, in the new high school and tech center. So in addition to maintaining and enhancing the connections to the Arms Forest, which is on the, to the north of, of the school, we're also proposing two outdoor learning areas, which uh, they're kind of hard to see on this plan, but they're those two circular features. Uh, on, there's one on the east side of the building and one on the west side, and these are really intended, uh, they're gonna be designed as a uh, small amphitheater type outdoor learning centers. Okay. Yeah. And so these, yeah, so these will be areas that uh, where classes can be held on, on nice days. Probably not too many in the winter, but. So uh, here. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then out. Uh, actually down where that number one is, just to the west of the building. Yeah, right yeah. there. Oh, yeah. down here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then this outdoor space here. Yeah. Oh yeah, and then the courtyard in the yeah in the middle of the building there. And so this, a lot of areas. Here's Road. Here's North Ave. Yeah. Arms Forest up here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so just a, a couple more highlights. The building and site are being designed to be highly energy efficient and sustainable. We will be pursuing a lead silver or better certification. Uh, fossil fuel free energy sources will be used. Uh, including primary use of, of electrification with geothermal uh, heating and cooling. 
and also solar photovoltaics. The roof structure will be solar ready for installation of solar units by a third party provider uh, who will um, own and operate uh, those, those solar units. There will be, a, as Tom said earlier, there will be a generous uh, natural light throughout the building. Again, that's something we heard loud and clear from the students and the, and the teachers as something being you know, critical uh, for a school building. You know, they've, that's something that they don't currently have at the downtown high school, and so they've been able to experience what it's like being in a building that has no windows. Uh, durable, long-lasting, low-maintenance finishes will be used inside and out. And then finally, there will be uh, extensive bicycle connections and bicycle parking and improved pedestrian access with new walkways and paths. So if you just want to, we can scroll through some of the renderings that we have here. So this is um, the, the south facade of the new building, you know, looking at it from the intersection of North Avenue and Institute Road. So that'd be this, the, yeah, this kind of the south frontage that looks on Institute Road. Uh, go ahead. And then this is the, the north uh, main entrance off of that uh, parking lot and bus drop-off uh, pickup area on the north side of the building. Go ahead. Uh, this is a rendering of a typical classroom with plenty of uh, window area for natural light. Uh, next slide, please. And then this is a rendering of the two-level student commons uh, that, that I talked about. So again, plenty of seating. That, uh, for students to uh, meet, eat lunch, uh, collaborate. Uh, the cafeteria will be on this first level. And then there's a stairwell uh, leading up to the second level. And you can see there's stadium seating off to the side of the stairs. Again, more, more spaces for students to uh, congregate um, and uh, collaborate. Uh, next photo or next rendering, please. A uh, rendering of the new auditorium. With the, with the balcony. Uh, next slide. And then this is a rendering of the Library of Media Center. Again, showing plenty of glass, a lot of uh, natural light, open floor plan um, for you know, today's modern school library and media center. And I think that might be it. OK, so I'll give it back to you. Thank you very much. Um, so we, as I said, we've been we've been um, really mindful of the impact of of this of this pending uh, bond vote on taxpayers, and um, so you can see that the overall cost to the BSD budget um, is on a 165 million dollar uh, bond is up is is there. And then the tax rate increase. Um, this is on a three hundred and seventy thousand, uh, hundred thousand dollar home, is fifteen point six seven percent, and um, and and the other percentages are 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 also there. Um, and one of the things that we've been working to uh, explain to this people of Burlington is that we've, the school board, uh, multiple school boards have been working uh, and advocating at the state to make sure that the funding for our city schools is equitable. And it has been inequitable historically, where the wealthier districts have had a lower tax impact uh, because of what we call the weighted pupil, which is essentially how much an individual student is weighted or funded or gets funded based on their weight. Um, and that has, that, what that has done is essentially given more resources to wealthier districts. So Essex, South Burlington, um, and CVSD, some of our close neighbors, who are also colleagues and friends of ours, they are benefiting from an inequitable funding model. And we are, we are, um, being harmed by an inequitable funding model that does two problematic things to us. One, the citizens of Burlington are committed to a high quality education for their, for their children. And so it, people are paying higher taxes than they, than they should have to 
for less um, for less service. So we have two. Pro so we have what this will do is fix two things for us that we can't exactly um, predict. Uh, we can't predict exactly how, um, like the percent of, in, of, of impact it will have on taxes yet. But what it, what it will do is it will ultimately mean that we don't need to, to um, tax as much for the level of service that we, that we need. And so this 15%, if you look at the way that districts across the, the, the region are impacted. You will see districts, some districts have a plus 15%, meaning they are, they are um, in going, to, going to benefit 15% and some that are negative uh, 15%. And so we are, we are in the, in, we are moving in a positive direction as it relates to the weighted pupil. Um, and, and, and it's about 15%. But that doesn't mean that it will totally balance this 15% because some of it needs to go to high quality, higher quality uh, services that are particularly underweighted now for English language learners and uh, for students who are um, in poverty and in, in, second, in secondary schools. Um, so the school board did a great job of, of working on that and that's been part of what what we've been doing to, to support taxpayers and improve um, our schools uh, moving forward. And I think it will, we, we know it will have an offset here. We don't know exactly how much. And so we want to be really careful not to promise something that isn't accurate. Uh, and so we're just showing you what the tax rate increase would be on the $165 million bond without any of that uh, weighted pupil ca uh, calculated in here. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, this shows, this is a little much to look at, but we do have a, a, a sort of calculator that you can see that shows how this impacts individual uh, home values. And then I think I just have one more slide. Um, do you want to hold? Do you want to ask your question now? It's just we're running out of time and you said you would take 10 minutes. I know, yeah, we took too much time. Like yeah, sorry. One more slide. Sound like a plan? Maybe, maybe we yeah. can stay a few minutes. Hurry up. Please. I mean, it's just we. No offense, but I've seen this part before. Got it. So Sorry really about that. Okay. Questions. Well, then let's talk. Go ahead. Do the last slide. Well, why, why don't we ask questions? Why don't we yeah, questions? That, that's fine. That's Thank fine. You. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, one question: Is the sixty-six million that is left over from what we voted on the bond before? Yes. Is that part of this one sixty-five million, or is that in addition? We still are bonding for that. And no. That 66 million was half of that we never borrowed, and the we and the other half of that um, we borrowed and are not and are, are going to return. So we're not using those funds. So that will have no impact on taxpayers. It's as if it never happened. Okay. The 165 is totally different. Okay. I'll let Sharon go. I've got another. Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I'm a broken record um, because you've never seen me before, but you've heard my voice <laughs> because I follow this through the planning yes. commission and the DRB with your sketch plan, et cetera. But I have two questions. One I'm asking on behalf of someone else who isn't here tonight. Um, and his concern is when you're talking about contamination, he has, he is, he feels that no one has answered whether or not, I understand it's around the windows and it's in the foundation. His concern is, have you done soil boring tests so that you know how much, how deep it is and how much earth you might have to remove? Or is that an unknown that might add some costs that won't be well received if you have to, have, if you have to come up with some additional funds? Sure, yeah, my, my understanding is that they have done all the, they, they have done those soil boring tests. And who would have done those? And uh, are they on file with the city? I guess that's my question. Uh, we have all that information. Yeah, we, we have an environmental consulting team that's been working on all of the testing. 
and they're currently working on a remediation plan that will be presented to the state, uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation and EPA for approval. But they've, um, this environmental team and district representatives have been meeting with EPA and DEC on a monthly basis for the last two years. So everyone is fully aware of the extent of the contamination and they're working on an acceptable plan to remediate. So that, that cost, although it's still not actually nailed down, is in the total yes. bonding yes. cost, correct? Yes. Yep. So you've anticipated a certain dollar amount mm -hmm. to address not only the foundation and the taking down of the building and, and getting rid of the building, but some soil remediation also. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and that's an important point that we had, haven't talked about a lot, but about $25 million of the project is the removal and remediation of the building and the site. So we have characterized the soil. We understand where the soil is contaminated. And it has not, thankfully, gone out too far from the building. Okay. Um, and so we know where that ends, and we generally know the, the extent of the soil damage. That, so that's for the person who isn't here, um, Karen's neighbor. Um, and, <laughs> and my question is, and this is the one that I've asked the mayor about at the Board of Finance, and I asked at the city council, and the superintendent, you did pick up on this, is that I feel that I'm hoping that the school, I'm hoping the community has gone to Montpelier, and I read your communication that Montpelier said, look at other avenues, but I'm not satisfied with that. I'm glad you that. read that part of it. I, 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 I did. I, I, I read that. You said I, it's a you know, local issue. Yes, well, I don't, I don't agree. And I feel that um, it's a community issue, and, and I'm just going to be very brief on this. I feel that First of all, they applied a more stringent standard than the EPA did, the state did. Um, and then when they realized that they couldn't really apply that statewide, they pulled back and changed the level. But in the meantime, they harmed Burlington students. They can, we can never re take away that harm. But financially, they made Burlington students learn remotely. There was a cost there. They made Burlington renovate Macy's, and I know the state did some money for you they on did. that, but I don't remember what that is. But they made us go that route, and that cost us some money, too. It wasn't just the state. Then they, because of all of this, we were going to build a new high school for $70 million. They delayed that. Now construction costs and, and materials are more expensive. So in my estimation, in my, my old estimation, and I've run this by another past member of the Board of Finance, um, I think they owe us around $15 million. Not, I'm not asking for the world, but I'm serious about this. And I really think, I really was hoping that the mayor and, and you, the, the school administration, would go and have not a confrontational conversation, but a factual confrontation, conversation with, this, with Montpelier about these various phases and the harm and the financial costs that, were incur that are incurred by this community. And I do feel that they should contribute somewhat to this new school. Yeah, I, I agree, and collectively, not that I can speak for everybody, but we collectively agree with everything you just said. Um, one of the, th and the reason I'm, I dwell a little bit on the per pupil is the impact to taxpayers, that that, that, will, that will offset some, but also that what we heard in Montpelier from behind the scenes, when we, I made a direct ask to the uh, Secretary of the Educa of Agency of Education, he came to Burlington in April, and we walked, we walked Macy's, and we went to the old school, and he said it was one of the worst schools in our state, and I, and I agreed, and I said yes, and we need 30 million to remediate the PCBs, and 20 million to build the technical center. And he, he said, I hear you. Um, and so we, we, did, we did make a direct ask. Um, and, and also, 
we did receive three and a half million to build uh, to to do Macy's from the governor. He did he did give us the, those funding the legislature, uh, but he helped us make that happen. Um, but what we were hearing is that people were talking at the state house about how we had already gotten our funding through the weighted pupil, and we disagree with that because that is something different. And so what we're doing now is we're really pushing on, uh, we're applying for grants in the current fiscal year budget that we're eligible for. Uh, and so we're gonna do that. We think there's funding there. And then we're also gonna gear up for the next legislative session. We're really serious and we have an MOU with the city um, uh, around our commitment to seeking funds to lower the bond, the borrowing that we need to do on this 165 bond, um, but we're really committed to continuing to seek funding. And one of the things that I think we may need to mobilize around, like we mobilized around the, the way to pupil, is construction aid. And so that's something that we'll, we'll probably start mobilizing around for the next legislative session. We are working with someone who's lobbying in, in uh, Montpelier, who helped us with the way to pupil, who really understands how this stuff works. Um, so we're really, really committed to continue, continuing to do that work. And then in the current budget, there's $32 million for PCB work. Uh, and so we think we're, that's across the whole state. So we're not going to get all of that. But we believe strongly we're going to be eligible for some of those funds once the rules are written and we're able to apply. Um, and, so, and there are other, there are other uh, avenues as well. Also, talk about federal Grants right, so we're also eligible for federal grants through the EPA, clean, uh, clean water, uh, there's a, there are environmental grants, there's grants that we can go for with Burlington Electric Department, so there are a couple of good opportunities there. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities for us within this current budget to, to apply for and, and we think receive significant fund, funding. So I just want to tell you that, you know, I'm on a fixed income, but I have said no to a number of the bonds that have come forward from from the city because I was saving my money. Of course, I couldn't because everyone else supported those bonds, but I saved my money for the schools. And you've got my vote. I am definitely, and I'm, I'm trying to convince people to make that sacrifice, but it's a big sacrifice. Yes. Um, and I really want this to happen. I really want the school to happen. So Thank you. anything you can do, anything that any one of us, well, any, anybody that supports it can do to help, yes. um, certainly I offer any assistance I can give you. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate that. We are, we are really going to be aggressive to seeking additional funding, and we think, there, we think we'll be able to, to bring money to this. Um, Karen, what? Carter, okay, go ahead. I mean, you'll get your, you'll get your yeah. last up, so I guarantee that. Oh, you have a mic. Well, no, I just appreciate, like, the, um, I mean, yeah, following it through, uh, through the news over for a little bit now and hearing Kathy talk about it. But um, I appreciate the, the equity lens uh, that, you, that you all took with it. Uh, there was one thing you said um, when talking about the energy that was going to be used and, and not relying on fossil fuels. Is natural gas and biofuels in that mix that you're counting as not, not fossil fuel? Yeah, um, yeah the, the architects would, would be better suited to, to answer this, but my, my understanding is that uh, they're they're moving forward with designing a system that won't require any, the use of any fossil fuels. Uh, however, one of the things they're still trying to figure out is whether gas is still needed for some of the curriculum, like some of the, the, the labs and things like that. Uh, but they're, you know, they've already decided that they're going to uh, design and construct the new kitchen without the use of gas, uh, which, is, which is new uh, for the high school. But the, the issue of whether or not some of the, the science classes still need gas is still out there uh, and needs to be determined. But the heating and cooling primarily. Heating and cooling will not use fossil fuels. Did you say geothermal? Yep. Wow. There's good geothermal access on the, on the land itself, which is good. And the, the building will be net zero ready 
which means that as technology advances, uh, we'll be able to generate the energy we need to run the building on, on the site. Yeah. Um, but we, we also need for some advancement around solar and other things to make that happen. But it's going to be a very energy efficient building. And that's actually one of the reasons we chose this building. That sort of compact design allows it to be more energy efficient too. So this is kind of a basic thing, but everything that was in the school, like the library supplies and the desks and, you know, anything, I mean, what's happened to all that? Is anything going to be reused or, and like you mentioned that the gym was fine, but we're still getting a whole new gym anyway, and the, all of A building is going? You're well, the gym, of... the gym is not fine. The gym is, we're able to use the gym for small parts of time. And A building is more than just the gym. So that gym space is is one of the lower airborne pe places with lower the lower okay. airborne PCBs. But there are higher airborne PCBs in other parts of A building, and so you get to a point where there's just no reusing. And it's also not just about air quality. Once we learned the problem in the air, we then had to test the materials, and we're we're regulated on how much PCBs are in the materials, and so those spaces still have PCBs in, in the materials. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's, and in terms of the, we have a, we actually, um, I don't know, we have a, a, a recently retired principal whose name is Shelly Mathias. She was at Edmonds Elementary School. Yeah, she's wonderful. She's gonna help us project manage getting out of the old, BHS and starting with A building, there's there we've taken a lot out, and are using it at BHS. We also have more at BHS that we need, that we will need that we will keep, and we have storage. We're we're going to rent some storage on Pine Street, and then there's some stuff there that is of value that we don't need anymore, and so we're going to have to figure out how to. Get you have people have access to that or whatever that, that however that looks and then there's also a lot of stuff that's old. I mean sometimes you, you know we tend to hold on to things, right? Uh, and so there's some of that too. So it's really that's a balancing act. But we are we are working on that and, and we're also going to go on catalog. People are asking. There are a lot of plaques. There are a lot of things that are that have um, uh, sentimental value, right? That, that are important that we don't want to lose. And so we're also looking at. at um, we're also going to make sure we're preserving those things. Thank you. Is there anybody on the screen who has a question? No hands up. I would have to say one thing. Here you go. Can I? Oh. Sorry. Thank, Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's, I haven't been to a school board meeting. I don't currently have um, children in the school district. Uh, and it's been two and a half years. But I want to say, Thank you for coming to lead the school district, <laughs> despite that COVID happened. <laughs> and you didn't, none of us knew that it was coming. And it must have been like Dante's circles of hell. <laughs> because it was just one thing after another that you were having to contend with. And you were new, your family was new to this community, and um, you are mastering it. All of you. And I just want to say thank you. It's been two and a half years, and I haven't had an opportunity to say it, but well done. Keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I feel just, I really appreciate that. And it's with the support of the school board. We have an amazing school board with Kathy and Claire and Jeff, the team. I mean, it's just, we have a wonderful, wonderful school board, and the community is so committed. And it has been, we've, there have been a lot of hard decisions, but I haven't felt like, I've, I feel good about, you know, the work. I really love the work, and I love the community, and the families here in our schools, and we love it too. So, okay. it's a gift to me. But thank you, I appreciate it. And on that note, I think maybe we can close the meeting. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks for thank attending. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.